Thank you very much. I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. I would like to talk about some problems which are motivated by computer science, especially concurrency, but the problems uh, themselves are purely topological. So what's the uh, main goal? The main goal is to, we have some concurrent program and our goal is to understand how it can execute it and what it exactly means. We start with the concurrent program with some concept which there are many concepts of concurrent programs invented by computer scientists. For example, PV programs or higher dimensional automata. From this object we we produce something which I, call, we, we, which I will call like state space. It's a direct space. And from the direct space, as you know, we can produce something which I will call execution space. It's, I will take just two points and say that the set of all directed space from the initial point to the final point is my execution space. And, well, we somehow expect that the homotopical properties of execution space somehow describe the behavior of the concurrent, concurrent system. It's, uh, it's true that components surely somehow describe the way, how many ways there are to execute something, but every component has, can have some non-trivial homotopy type and maybe it somehow contributes to the behavior of concurrent problems. <laughs> So, the first definition I will quickly recall it's these spaces, it's just a topological spaces. We look at points of the space as possible states of a program. There are some collection of paths, I will call this path directed paths. Uh, these are possible partial executions of our program, and there are some accents which were mentioned before, so I'm not going to recall them. Uh, the execution space from X to Y is just a space of directed paths and there is one very, uh, very important example. When you take a cube, there is a natural directed structure of these cubes. You take all paths which have non-decreasing coordinates and all squares or cubes which will appear here will be directed. It means that you can, you can travel only in some directions. Okay. So, I will talk about basically two models of concurrent programs. The first concept is the PV programs of Dijkstra, which were mentioned by Elizabeth before. The situation is like this, you have some number of processes which are neither bad, bad or evil, but they're predict predictable. They need to perform some, some number of operations and these operations include acquisitions of releases of some resources. There are some number of resources, every resource can be acquired by at most some number of, of processes and so we can assign to, to such a PV program a state space which is some <coughs> subset of directed interval and I'm not going to say in details how to do this. I, instead I will show you some examples. This is a squeeze cross example at every talk about directed spaces is expected to present this picture so I'm doing this also. Uh, you have two processes two resources, every resource has a capacity one. So all resources acquire both of them and then release both of them, but not in the same order. So you can, well, there are, you can get to deadlock here. You can have an unreachable state here, but I don't care about this. The only thing I will care is Assume that the execution started with the initial point, went to the final point, how, what is the space of the, well, successive executions which fully succeeded. And in this case, what you get is something which is a discrete space after homotopy. It has two points. 
either one process goes first or the second process goes first. Nothing more is possible, there is no non-trivial topology. If it were the only example, it would be interesting from my point of view. But there are other examples. The second example is when you have three processes, only one resource, but the capacity of this resource is two. It means that two processes are allowed to use this resource at the same moment. So all programs are the same. They just acquire this resource and release it. And you can see that the execution space, the, sta the, the state space of such, such program is just a cube with some smaller cube inside removed. So you cannot enter into, into the middle here. And the executions are, the space of executions is just a circle. Because, well, you can, this, this dots mean executions which are sequential. There are six sequential executions and you can easily find the homotopy between every sequential execution. So what you get it's just a circle. Well, it's not proof, but I will prove it later. So, uh, okay. Well, some, with some notion of Euclidean, Euclidean cubical complex, which I'm going to introduce to show how complicated this state <coughs> spaces and execution spaces of, cube, of PV programs could be. The cubical Euclidean complex is something very simple. You take a Euclidean space, you take a collection, a collection of something I call elementary cubes. It's some cubes which has, which are well, integral and the size in every dimension is either zero or one. Then you sum up, sum up all these cubes, you take, well, the you'll get something like, like this in this picture. And what's basically easy to see up to some reparameterizations, well, first Euclidean complexes are directed, of course. Uh, the second, what's, what you can see, the state space of any PV program can be made into, into a Euclidean complex. So it's not something surprising, which is something a little more, a bit, a bit more surprising, is that almost all Euclidean complexes are almost state spaces of PV programs. There were some consequences, which is not quite trivial. You can obtain any, any finite homotopy type as a connected component of the execution space of a PV program. So it's hard to generate an example. The smallest example, for example, you want to produce something which has torsion in homology, it's a projective plane. So the simplest example I can produce is, is a PV program which has six processes, about 40 resources, and every process acquires every resource. So. It's not something we can, you can find in random, probably. Okay, but it's, I'm not going to talk about the details. I'm going, I was only going to, to tell you that what you can get in, even in its easy, easy set, setting it could be quite complicated. So let me introduce the second model for concurrent computing. First, introduce the notion of semi-cubical set. You probably know what the cubical set is. My semi-cubical sets are exactly cubical sets with no degeneracies. You have for every integer, for every non-negative integer, you have a set of abstract cubes having this dimension. You have some operators which tell you which, which cube is a facet of which cube and it has to satisfy some relations. And there is, for me, one very important example. is the standard cube. I mean cube here not by something geometric, but a semi-cubical set, which is called cube. This standard cube 
i cubes of an n cube are all sequences of I a1 to a n, sequences of symbol 0, 1, or star, which has exactly i stars. It means that at some dimension you, can, you must have 0, at some dimensions you must have 1, at some dimensions you can have anything between 0 and 1, and it's denoted by star. So another example <coughs> is obviously Euclidean complexes are semi-cubical sets. So, and when you have a, some semi-cubical set, you can pass to a ge geometric re realization. The ge geometric realization is the st standard thing. You take cubes, you glue them somehow in the way as this boundary operators say you, and the cubes which you use here are directed. Oh. And it's... Uh, Higher dimensional automata is something which computer scientists use to describe uh, executions of concurrent programs. It's just a semi-cubical set with some distinguished final vertex, initial vertex, and some labeling which I won't care uh, about. And, well, the execution, the state space is just a geometric realization of a cubical of a semi-cubical set. The execution space is a space of paths from the initial point to the final point, which lie in this, which lie in this geometric realization. So uh, my goal will be to calculate the homotopy type of the execution space of any, any given higher dimensional automaton. In fact, I will have some, some more assumptions about this higher dimensional automata. I won't prove anything in general, but first, before I do anything, I will give you an interpretation of this execution space as configuration spaces. So, I will, I need an assumption. I need to assume that my cubical set can be embedded somehow in the cube. It's not very restrictive because, for example, every Euclidean complex can be embedded into a single cube it's just because of the sequence the sequence of well succeeding intervals can be embedded into a cube and well then all products can be embedded and everything works fine and what's the construction first assume that we have a uh, cubical complex, which is embedded in a cube, we define the space of strictly, strictly increasing paths. Directed paths are paths which are not, which are just non-decreasing at every coordinate. This, this will be paths which are strictly increasing. Then you can thicken your, your geometric realization a little bit. Well, don't use if you have if you have some cube and it's expected to be zero at some coordinate, you can allow every number between zero and half, but half is excluded. And you'll get something thicker. And it's not <coughs> difficult to prove that the space of directed, directed uh, paths on the usual geometric realization is homotopy equivalent to the space of strictly increasing path on this thick, thick complex, then you can define a section map. Well, for every path, you get a sequence of numbers and of n numbers and the given number says you at what time you passed one half at the coordinate one. So, and this is continuous. At least, well, you can, if you consider strictly increasing paths. And SK is, in fact, a homotopy equivalence into its image. The image of this section map is not the whole cube, but into its image is the homotopy equivalence. I will call the image of this path the configuration, cubical configuration space. And the cubical configuration space can be described as follows. 
you take, well, it's a subspace in the open cube and it consists of such points that this kind of, well, delta, chronicle delta type symbols are included in the cube and I will give you an example. Okay, for example, you have some complex K and you try to guess if the given point is lies in this or it doesn't lie in this. So you and assume that this uh, these numbers are such that T1 is least, T2 and T T4 are a little larger but equal and T3 is the largest, so you have several conditions. One condition is that star 0, 0, 0 must lie in K. The other condition is that when you put stars in places 2 and 4, because, well, at this point you have both this, these points, you put 1 at the place 1 because the point 1 was before, and put 0 at place 3 because 3 is yet to, yet to happen you'll need to demand that these three, three cubes are lie in your complex. So this cubical configuration spaces, well, I should explain why do I call them configuration spaces at all. Because, well, the classical configuration spaces are just uh, special cases and the usual configuration space, you just consider sequences of endpoints which all are different. So when I take my cubical configuration space with a parametrized, which is one skeleton of an simplex, you'll get exactly the same thing. When you take a not k plus one equal configuration space, it's again cubical configuration space with respect to k skeleton of, of this cube. You can think about something more complicated. <coughs> you can consider simplicial configuration spaces. There is some simplicial complex which says you what points can appear in the same place. And uh, well, and again, the simplicial configuration space is, is a special case of a cubical configuration space. There is some method of constructing cube, cubical complex out of simplicial complex, and this, this is a configuration space. And, well, it's something even more general. I look at collections of some points, of, and these points at every in every family must be all different, but there are some rules, what families can intersect, what are not. And again, well, this also can be in interpreted as cubical configuration spaces. And there are some results about configuration spaces, which are equal to execution spaces of uh, automata, which could be embedded in a cube, they are the same thing. The first result of Bearden and Velker, Velker, which calculate homology of non-k equal configuration spaces. I'm not going to tell you exactly what this homology is. I will tell you that it's free. It's, it's concentrated in dimensions divisible by k minus one, and it's huge. Uh, and the problem which they solved is exactly equivalent to the calculating the homology of the execution space of n processes which use resource of capacity, capacity k only once. So this result was generalized by Roy Meshul, Meshulam and Martin Rausen very recently and if I understand the paper correctly they proved that when you take, when you know the homology of the configure of singular conf of simplicial configuration space, this usual kind, you can calculate out of this homology of the configuration space which uses, well, families of different points. So what's the result? The result, what's the consequences of this result? The consequences are that 
we fully understand the homology of execution spaces of any number of processes uh, and any programs, assuming that they use only one resource of some given capacity. So what I will talk to you about, I will give you some construction which allows to calculate homology of any, any cubical complex, which is double in the cube. And basically, in quite general, it's, it's say, well, you can write down a program which calculates this. But then I'm able to, to use this construction to, to do something, and I'm able to reprove the results in some, some other way. So this, this construction used seems to be quite efficient. So first, I will somehow relax my restrictions. I want, for some time, I will be considered something I call proper semi-cubical sets. A, a semi-cubical set is proper if it has the following property. You take all cubes, for every cube you can you can take a set which uh, consists of the initial vertex of this cube and the final vertex of this cube. And if every different cube gives you different sets, I say the cubical set is proper. And the properness is something weaker than being embeddable uh, in the cube. However, there are simply semi simplicial sets which are very non proper. So it's not, not quite general. And formally, I will, I will assume something even, even weaker that uh, non -looping co uh, length non-looping covering is proper, which is, well, I'm not going to tell you what's a length non-looping covering. So. But what's the idea of Construction, well, we have some cubical complex. We want to calculate paths on this, the space of paths on this cubical complex. But the problem is there is a lot of paths. I would like to have less paths. So there are better paths and worse paths, and I, I, will, I want to remove these worse ones. For me, good path is a path which I call tame, and it satisfies the following condition. I take a segment of this path, and this segment is either contained in some cube or it contains some vertex. In other words, you mean, it means that when you travel here, you're allowed to pass from a cube to another cube only at vertices. So this green path is tame, this red is wild because it passes here from one cube to another cube but the path is not in the vertex. So there is some computer scientific meaning for, for this kind of path. This path correspond to syn synchronized executions. Every here in this, when you take this green path, there are two processes. And first, both processes are active. They take the first step, then this uh, vertical process stops <coughs> and the horizontal process proceeds and then they both perform some operation. Here, well, some process ends step and, and the other process is still active. So, uh, and I say that some space, some cubical set has a taming property if the space of all tame paths are homo is homotopy equivalent to the space of all paths. And the theorem <laughs> says that every cubical complex, it means a semi-cubical set which satisfies some properness relation, has a taming property. And then all the executions are, <coughs> can, you can consider only synchronized executions and you'll get, still get the same. Uh, the proof of this is very easy, and it's not very easy. It's very easy because you can write down just some formula which, which shows you homotopy equivalence between tame paths and all paths. 
It's not so easy because the formula is complicated. So, <coughs> and there was a question. Well, I don't know the answer. Does any semi-cubical set has the taming property? You can ask even more general questions like, does every cubical set has a taming property, or does every CW complex has a taming property? I don't know. I don't know the answers here, but maybe it could be interesting. So, so once we know that we can consider only tame paths, I will introduce something which I will call cube chains. The cube chains in the complex from some vertex to another vertex, the sequence of cubes, such that the first cube starts at the first vertex, then the next, the next vertex, the next cube starts when the previous one ends, and so on and so on, until you will get to, to B. The, the dimension of such a cube is, is something which could be interpreted as a degrees of freedom of choosing of paths going through, through this cube chain is the sum of dimensions of cubes minus one for every cube. And, uh, okay, you can use this cube chain in the following way. First, you can observe that every tame path, uh, well, for every cube, you can define the set of paths which lie in this cube chain. And then you observe that every tame path lies in some cube chain. It's obvious because it's just a definition of a tame path. Uh, for every cube chain, the space of paths which lie in such cube chains is contractible, which doesn't look very surprising. Then you prove that when you take two cube chains, then the intersection of paths lying in both cube chains is either empty or there is some smaller cube chain, which is the intersection. And well, finally, you get some partial order, and the nerf lemma implies that our space of executions on, on, this, simple, on this cubical complex is just a poset of, it's just a nerf of a poset of cube chains. So, we're happy because, well, posets are nice. We started with some space of paths, which is usually infinite dim dimensional. And we have a result that our space is just homotopy equivalent to the nerve of some poset. But <coughs> there are, well, there are <coughs> nice posets and even nicer posets. <coughs> and these even nicer posets are CW posets. A uh, poset is a CW poset if it satisfies something like this. When you take one element of this poset, you take a sub poset of elements which are less than this thing, and you take a nerve of this, then the geometric realization of the sub poset is just a sphere. And there are another description of these kinds of posets. These posets are just posets of cells of regular CW complexes. So, and it, it's, uh, it's this, this poset we got, the poset of cube chains, is actually a CW poset because every, this, this, Nerves of, of sub-posets uh, are just product of plurimity hydra. And what's the significance of this for, for computer scientists? Of course, you can calculate the homology of the poset, but it's even easier to calculate the homology of CW poset. Because when you calculate the homology of a poset, you must take into account all simplices which are chains of elements of this poset. Here you can calculate homology using a cellular, a cellular complex, and generators in your chain complex are just elements of the poset. So it's, it's nice to use. 
So a few words about permutahedra. The permutahedron, the classical definition is that you take just all permutations of the finite set and you take the convex half of this of these permutations. But what I'm more interested in is the phase poset. The phase poset of this polytope is a poset of ordered partitions of the set having n elements. And this and so what I claim that the poset of ch cube chains on a single cube is exactly the poset, the phase poset of a permutahedron. Why is it? They both are posets of ordered, ordered partitions. Because when you take a cube chain, you first you go in some set of directions, then you go into another set of directions and so on. It gives you some ordered partition. So it's exactly the same thing. So there is a con easy consequence. When you consider all chains which are less than the given cube chain, what you get is a product of permutahedra. Well, products of permutahedra basically should be <coughs> taken equal with permutahedra itself because the facets, faces of permutahedra are in general products of permutahedra. So still there is a this this cube chain poset is a CW poset. So let me show you two examples. <coughs> the definition of CW poset means that something has to be a sphere, and over here, what is it? The product of spheres? Uh, okay. There's it's a boundary of a point. Yes, because the difference oh, is here. Well. Boundary. It's because it's difference here. It's well, you take the boundary of this. Yeah, sorry. And I will give you two examples. So take two examples of cubical complexes and look what's uh, this this complex of given by cube chains is. The first example is when you start with with a hollow cube. Then you take just when you obtain just a hexagon, because what are zero cells? Zero cells are cube chains which have dimension zero. It means that they contain only, only edges. So there are six ways to travel from V to W using only edges. And there are six chains which have dimension one. This chain is you take a square, then an edge, or you take an edge, then a square, so now six, they're connected like here. Another example is when you take the uh, subdivision of a square, you'll get something like this. No. So, so, some summary of the models. For every bipointed cubical complex, there is a regular CW complex such that this CW complex is homotopy equivalent to the space of executions. The cells of the CW complex are exactly chain, chain uh, cube chains. And this construction is very nice because it's functorial. When you take some morphism, some cubical morphism, it would induce you induce you a morphism of corresponding CW complexes, preserving cells, and so on. It's even nicer because it's minimal amount of factorial constructions, so you can't get any, any smaller construction as long as it's factorial. Well, it has a serious disadvantage. It's not minimal. How far it's not minimal? You could expect here one zero cell and one one cell. You have six of each kind. You should expect here just a single point. You have some squares and intervals. It's not optimal. Can you make it optimal? In general, you cannot because you may expect any finite homotopy times appear here. So 
it would be difficult to get a general answer. But, well, can we do better? Well, we can. We can use a discrete MOS theory. Uh, the MOS theory, several months ago, when before I tried to do this, I thought that discrete MOS theory is overrated. <laughs> now I think it's underrated. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let me give you a few words about this. A more discrete MOS theory is something is very simple. You start with some, well, I will work, work here with CW posets, which are exactly regular CW complexes. And you can define something like a discrete vector field. Discrete vector fields are just pairs of, of cells, such that the first cell, this, this A is a phase set of B. And the discrete field is collection of disjoint vectors. And you can define a flow. A flow is something like this. You take a cell. You go with your vector to the larger cell. Then you go to some boundary cell. But it, this shouldn't be contained in your vector field. Then you go on and go on and go on. It's kind of flow. And your field, discrete vector field is nice. It means that it's a gradient field if it doesn't allow for any circular flows. If there are circular flows, the whole theory fails and doesn't produce anything useful. So what we need to do is to construct some gradient field on our cubical chain pulse set. If we do that, well, if we construct a gradient field, there are some cells which are called critical. These are those which do not, which do not belong to any vector. Then you construct a CW complex so that its cells are just critical cells of your vector field. And you want, if you want to calculate the cellular homology, <coughs> the homology of this, then the cellular homology of this, of this uh, CW complex can be somehow calculated. Well, it's not difficult. So our goal will be to construct a gradient field. And again, we have to restrict okay. us somehow. We still have to go back to the assumption that our cubical complex is embedded into, into a cube. So, how to construct a discrete, discrete vector field? Let's start with the easiest examples possible. What we need to construct? We need to construct a vector field on some sub-complex of a permutohedron. So we need to understand permutohedra first. To understand permutohedra first, we need to understand simplices first. So, if you want to construct a vector field on a simplex, you can have pairing, you just take any set. If it doesn't contain a maximal element, you can add a maximal element, you'll get some vectors, and there will be some, something which can be part. It's a single maximal element because there is no empty, empty cell. Well, what you can do when you want to construct a Gradient field on a cube, it's a little bit more complicated. The first you start with your original idea. When you have, well, cells of, this, of the cube are sequences of zeros, ones, and stars. When you have a sequence which ends with one, you can take a vector which goes to the, the same sequence but ending with star, okay, and you have a vector, you have vectors which cover everything outside unless the last coordinate is zero. But if the last coordinate is zero, you can proceed inductively. So the only, the only critical uh, cell which remains is just a zero cell. Okay, it's quite obvious, but I'm going to sell you the general method how to do this in permutohedral case, so I think it would be useful. 
What can you do with permutahedra? In this case, elements of a repose set are ordered partitions, and if your partition has a singlet on maximal element at some place which is not the last place, then you connect this element with the succeeding set. Okay? What's left is when maximal element is a singlet on at the, at the last place, then you proceed inductively. Well, you'll get something like this. So we ha have something like a canonical gradient field on a permutohedron. So now we have a general cubical complex, which is subcomplex in a cube. It means that its cubical chains are embedded into a permutohedron. So we take a standard vector gradient field on a permutohedron and restrict it to our subcomplex. It's a very nice construction. And of course, many cr new critical cells appear. If, lamb, if there is some vector from lambda to mu, lambda is in our complex, but mu is not, then lambda is a new critical, new critical cells, and a lot of new critical cells appear. But we can el eliminate some of them. All critical fields will have the following form, and they will have such a form that M and cannot be connected with B. Well, M here means maximal element, like, like N before. This cannot be connected, so you notice that this, this new critical cells appear in bunches. And the bunch here is maximal element, some set which you connect, connect, and some sequence before, some sequence after. So this family of critical cells is, is isomorphic to a product of some smaller, smaller cubical, uh, smaller cube chain posets. So you can proceed inductively. It's a little bit more complicated. So construction looks very naive, but we have constructed something which has a few cubical cells. So let's see how it works in special cases. Well, first special cases is a case when you take an not k plus one equal configuration space. It means that your k here is a k skeleton of a cube. <coughs> And if you take this, this construction, you can see that the only critical cells which, which appeared have dimensions divisible by k minus 1. So if k is larger than 2, you know that uh, nothing reduces and the homology is, is, is free, concentrated in, in given dimensions. And with some effort, you can generalize it to the case, <coughs> well, you can well have many such skeleton glued together with, with itself. It works. And what can you do with this father? You can produce some fast algorithm calculating, calculating this execution space, which could, which could be a little interesting for computer scientists. You can analyze some random PV programs and maybe something more. So it's all I want to tell you. Thank you. I know I should, but well. Have you computed by hand? Yes. Some of these more every every time I try to implement something, I start starting to understand how it works, and I start to calculating by hand some examples, and it seems out that I am able to calculate many cases by hand, and I'm lazy enough to not to implement it. So. <laughs> <coughs> so I'm I'm looking for students who would like to implement it. <laughs>
But I think I think it's worth implementation, finally, in this case too. Another question? Um, so how does it compare to this original Bjorn result about the configuration space in the uh, you asking about some deep deep relation comparison between what happened there and what happens here. In fact, I don't understand what's the relation between his approach and my approach. It may be interesting because they use completely different methods. Yes. I'm not too sure. Do you think there are other things? Yes. I mean, what do they use? They don't use like a CW implementation of this one? Or they don't like, I mean, how do you, how else do you do? So in this, let's say, non, non k equal, uh, essentially they pass to the component. If I'm not interrupting, uh, it's just a quick question. It's interesting, permitohedra, of course, are beautiful objects that yeah. keep appearing everywhere. And it's very nice to see, see them here as well. It's interesting that uh, they appeared under very funny name Zilchgorns in the work in the work of Milgram yeah. when they studied uh, models for homotopy uh, for uh, loop spaces of, of spins. So just a side remark, uh, it is possible that your what you are developing may have also some nice consequences in that direction. Yeah, so they thank you for mentioning. What was the review in the work of Milgram? Uh, Milgram uh, Carlson and Milgram have a, a chapter in Handbook of uh, uh, Topology where they actually, I think, describe this is uh, this construction where they describe James model and other yeah. things, and they also describe Hermitohedra uh, in the context of loop uh, model space. But what was what the expression you made? <laughs> oh, uh, they are all Zilstrom. And I asked people why Milgram asked the uh, name them. Zilstrom, nobody knows. <laughs> Well, let's thank the speaker one more time.